Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is a great privilege to be a Christian. Let's not forget that. When we're in the midst of all the stuff that's going on in our life, difficulties, sadnesses, stress, people treating us poorly, having too much to do. I saw something was kind of a joke. It said, uh, uh, I, have, I, I had a whole lot of things to do today. Um, I'll, uh, something like, uh, I have all these things to do today, and so I'll do them. Uh, now I have a whole lot of things to do tomorrow. Because it's like that, isn't it? You have so many things to do, and, and you don't get them all done, and everything like that. But what a privilege it is to be a Christian. What a privilege it is to have Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, within our heart, and to be allowed to participate in God's love for the world. What an amazing thing it is. I remember when I was a child, and I would, uh, I was, this was retold to me because I don't remember it myself, but uh, I would be working with my dad, working, quote unquote, and he'd be building something, and there'd be some sawdust, and I'd rub it on my hands and put it on my shirt and say, Dad, I've been working. And then I would want to help hammer a nail. Well, of course, my dad would have to basically start the nail and guide my hand, and eventually the nail would kind of get messed up, and he'd put it back, and I thought that I was hammering the nail, right? And every child goes through that. I hope every child goes through that, actually. And uh, I think that that's a little bit like what we do with God, except he doesn't necessarily always hold the nail. <laughs> he has us do it ourselves. Even if we do something poorly, through his grace, things happen. For all of us, not just for priests, not for, just for, for bishops, deacons, not just for people serving in the choir, not just for people that are older, have any kind of positions of uh, authority. For everybody, all of us have this privilege of working for God, not as a, a burden, but as a privilege. And I see that today. Uh, we, have, we see a great miracle today, a very important miracle, because it, it has a lot of theological significance. And it really led into the, the Lord speaking of his body and blood when he, when he fed the 5,000. Because, feeding, of course, God feeds us. He fed with bread and with fish, and he also feels, feeds us with the bread from heaven, that is himself, his flesh, his body and blood. So there's a lot of theological significance. You can talk about those things. They're important. And, of course, it's amazing. God has so much power. He can do anything he wants. Five loaves and two fish, enough maybe for three people to have a very, very small, small meal. And he fed 5,000 men and besides that, women and children. So probably 20,000, 30,000 people all fed with five loaves and two fish. And they took up 12 baskets full, one for each one of the apostles. Giant baskets. They're also called, the, the real translation is provision baskets. So they're these big baskets full. Not, not a little basket, but a big basket full of the remains of the meal. Enough to feed them again, basically. And that's magnificent. But what really jumps out to me every time is how they're in a desert place. There's nothing to eat. There's very little water, if any. People are tired. People clearly need to eat. And so the apostles are concerned. And they come to him and saying, this is a desert place. The time is well past. Send the multitude away that they might get something to eat. And of course, the Lord, he never really answers questions the way you expect. <laughs> he never, he always is different, a little different the way he answers something. So instead of saying, uh, okay, or I see your point, he says, you give them to eat. People who have no food, you give them to eat. And they didn't have anything. So they found a little boy and they said, well, we have here five loaves and two fish and another rendering and another gospel says but what is this to feed so many what is it it's nothing it's nothing at all to feed so many but he says all right so then he says bring it hither to me and 
He commands the multitude to sit down on the grass. He takes the loaves and the, and the fish and he gives thanks. And then they just start distributing loaves and fish to all of the people. What an amazing miracle it must have been to see this happen. But the great privilege was the apostles could participate in God's mercy. He said, you give them to eat. He didn't say, I will give them to eat. He doesn't give people to eat anymore. We give to eat. We serve the liturgy. And of course, the Holy Spirit causes the elements to turn into the body and blood of Christ, the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, of course. It's always by God's grace that things happen. But Jesus Christ is not walking the earth preaching to us and having miracles. There's a lot of miracles, but the miracles are from his people. And there's a miracle of the Eucharist every single liturgy. And he's not present in his body like we are now, but in his body and blood in a mystical way so that we can be fed of him. And we can participate in his mercy. We can participate in action for the world. That's a great privilege. Don't lose track of that. It's very important. This is one of the principles that I, I learned. I don't know. I, we have troubles in life, like I said. When you have troubles in life, you, you're thinking about your troubles. <laughs> well, that doesn't do any good to think about your troubles. Because thinking about your troubles just makes you more troubled. But thinking of other people's troubles, caring about other people, compassion for other people, doing God's work for other people, whether it be a, a word to them, some sort of support, some wisdom you might impart, or maybe just being there, or maybe refraining from judging, whatever it is, you're giving mercy to God's people. And when you do that, there's this miraculous, beautiful thing that happens to the heart. The heart, which otherwise is closed in on itself, <clears throat> thinking about its own problems, the heart opens. And the heart reaches out to others. In the midst of, of our problems, we reach out to other people with problems. And don't anybody tell me, by the way, that you can't do this. We already had a couple of weeks ago, or maybe last week, from uh, Romans. We're supposed to help the weak. Every, there's somebody weaker than you. And even if the, the, everybody looks stronger than you, there's a moment when they're weak. So we have no excuse. We have the capacity to reach out to others. And you must tap into this capacity, which of course is God-given, and it's maintained by the grace of God. So if we have to, of course, have a Christian life in order to be able to keep this capacity. You have the capacity to help others. You have the capacity to reach out to others. And as you do that, your heart opens. Beautiful thing, beautiful thing. The more, the older I get, uh, the more I see that life is really, really simple. Now, people make it difficult. The heresies of the day make it difficult, and, and the complicated politics of the day, it's, it's difficult. and All these things, they're difficult, there's no doubt. But the solution is simple. First of all, the solution is you change because you can't change anybody else. So that's your major solution. You change. And then part of that solution is just love God, love your neighbor, love your friend, love your enemy. Struggle to impart the mercy of God, the grace of God to others. And yes, indeed, God asks us to impart his grace to others something that we can't hold on to, something we can't even bear, and yet he says, you give them to eat. So you are told to give them to eat. And if you take this to heart and help others, whether it be by your prayer or in, in some physical way, doesn't matter. I'm sure it'll always be by prayer, but it might include other things. You will be, you'll become bigger. Your heart becomes warmer. And your troubles are not so difficult when you do this. This is the way of the gospel, and it's such a privilege to be able to live this way, isn't it? That's what this story is telling us. And of course, when I say story, I mean a historical story, a factual story. It's not a parable. It is a fact that the Lord fed 5,000 men, perhaps 30,000 people or more, with only five loaves and two fishes. And it's a fact that he said to his disciples who thought that 
always lost, really. How are we going to get this done? You give them to eat. And it's a fact that he tells us to give them to eat. So listen to those words. Look outside yourself. And the more you look outside yourself, the happier you will be. That's just a fact. The more you look outside yourself, you will have God within you. That's what this story teaches. That's really what so many things in the, Old, in, the, in the Old Testament even, but especially in the New Testament. Paul's epistles, the epistles of John and Peter, they all teach that. The Gospels all teach this, that we have this privilege of giving the mercy of God to others, passing it on, because God gives us mercy. God gives us life. And we have the privilege to pass on that life to others. So try to do that. This week, think less of yourself. Think more of others. And perhaps maybe you're not so good at it right now. Maybe everything won't go so well. You'll think of somebody and you try to help them and you'll just, you know, it won't go well. Maybe they won't receive it well or whatever. Don't give up. Keep doing it. You'll develop wisdom in how to help people. You'll develop wisdom in how to know when people have a need and how to, re how to respond to that need. Of course, with prayer first. And you'll just get better. And you'll get happier. And your troubles won't seem to be so big. Glory be to God that we, small people, sinful people, are told by him, you give them to eat. God bless you and help you in all things. Amen. <laughs>